The cozy relationship Kyleman had with the Army resulted in the Horn Palace having been fenced into the Brooksfield property. In its time, the Horn Palace was the place to be in San Antonio. It had a central dance floor surrounded by private dining rooms. Well, he had the world's largest selection of horns in the world there. That's what he, what he had, and all the chairs were made out of horns. The walls were 20 feet high, decorated with 3,500 animal heads, horns, stuffed snakes, and birds, valued at $100,000. The collection formed the foundation for what became the world-famous Buckhorn Hall of Horns later displayed at San Antonio's Lone Star Brewery. In 1921, Wild Bill Kyleman was shot at the Horn Palace. It was the price he paid for operating on the fringes of society. He survived the attack, as well as other incidents, including a murder charge. However, his reputation led the Army to sever ties with him as the Horn Palace faded into history. Looming larger at Brooksfield than the Kyleman's and overshadowing the progress made in early primary flight training were lighter than aircraft. The age of airships appeared to dwarf the skies over the Alamo City. Airships were part of post-World War I American military aviation development that contributed to the evolution of commercial air travel. The U.S. had no military dirigibles during the war, but recognized the utility of airships based on German innovations. Nearly as long as three football fields at 800 feet, the Graf Zeppelin, named for the founder of the German airship industry, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, was the largest rigid airship in the world when it made its maiden voyage from Germany to America in 1928. A marvel of engineering, the ship featured luxurious dining, gourmet-styled cuisine, and ocean liner-like staterooms. A first-class ticket cost $3,000, the equivalent today of $136,000. The Graf Zeppelin's commercial success was partially built upon U.S. military contributions to dirigible development made during the early 1920s. Brooksfield and other U.S. airship bases helped influence the evolution of commercial airship operations. The U.S. Navy eventually purchased the Graf Zeppelin, renaming it the Los Angeles. It became the most successful airship in America's military dirigible fleet. Prior to the U.S. Navy's involvement in dirigible development, the Army had begun experimenting with balloons and airships. Until the 1930s, observation was considered to be the main function of aviation. Observation balloons and airships were considered superior to airplanes because of their capability to stay aloft for longer periods. Brooksfield was one of five U.S. military bases selected to conduct balloon and observation training. A year earlier, San Antonio had hosted such training when the observation school at Camp John Wise, located four miles north of town, was established on January 19, 1918. Nicknamed Balloonton, Camp Wise had trained 5,800 men in aerial observation during World War I. The Camp Wise Observation School moved to Brooksfield in May 1919. Prevalent at Brooksfield were two types of balloons, tethered captive balloons and untethered free-floating balloons. These balloons were classified as non-rigid because they lacked an interval frame structure. Also known as blimps, Brooksfield balloons were often motorized and used as primary trainers for the more advanced and larger rigid and semi-rigid dirigibles nicknamed Zeppelins. Brooksfield balloon training produced skilled pilots, some of who contributed to aviation science. Among them was Orville Anderson, who made history on November 11, 1935. He piloted Explorer II, a 3.7 million cubic foot research balloon 
that set a then new altitude record of 72,395 feet. The flight's experiments in the stratosphere included high altitude effects on human physiology, something Brooks Air Force Base became known for decades later as the Air Force Center for High Altitude Research. U.S. Army leaders recognized the military value of developing an American airship program. They planned to use airships for several purposes, including reconnaissance missions and to transport troops and material. The U.S. Navy relied upon the Italian dirigible industry to help jumpstart the American airship program. They had ordered the first custom-built airship delivered to America, the Roma. It was the largest semi-rigid airship in the world at the time. It was transported by sea and reassembled at Langley Field, Virginia. After acquiring the Roma from the Navy, the Army planned to move it to Brooks Field to train pilots for long distance flights. This initiative led to the construction of a Texas landmark, the 91,000 square foot dirigible hangar at Brooks Field. At 450 feet long, 125 feet wide, and 116 feet high, it was an engineering marvel. Costing $1.5 million to build, it was the first Army hangar erected with counterbalance sliding doors that were electronically operated. We're standing on what was once the foundation of the dirigible hangar here at Brooks Air Force Base. It was a very large building, uh, in fact the largest building in Texas at the time I believe, and, and the only uh, larger buildings were hangars. Uh, that were located uh, elsewhere that the Navy used at Langley and uh, another site in New Jersey. Now, what you see behind me here is basically the width to almost that tree line is the width of the hangar and could hold um, uh, an airship, one large airship and one small airship, uh, they say a capacity of 1,500,000 cubic feet in size, a, a huge dirigible. Unfortunately, the hangar's intended occupant, the Roma, never made it to Brooks Field. Prior to its maiden voyage test flight in February 1922, the hydrogen-filled Roma exploded over an Army supply base at Norfolk, Virginia, after colliding with a high-voltage power line. Undeterred by this accident, the Army decided to fly another dirigible to Brooks Field in 1922. They selected the C-2, a former Navy dirigible that had been used at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland to train aeronauts in aerial bombing. Army leaders were eager to use the C-2 for the first U.S. transcontinental airship flight. On September 22, 1922, the C-2 left Langley Field on its history-making voyage. Three days later, it arrived at Brooks Field to much fanfare. Throngs of San Antonians flocked to see the C-2 make its first public appearance in the Alamo City. The next day, the C-2 left Brooks Field to complete its historic flight. It landed at Ross Field, located at the Presidio in San Francisco. The 181,000 cubic foot, 263 foot long C-2 returned to Brooks Field on October 14th en route back to Langley Field. Fate, however, prevailed when the C-2 was being maneuvered out of the dirigible hangar. The airship, caught in a crosswind, was lifted 10 feet in the air. During its descent, the bottom of the control car was damaged. Two more strong wind gusts caused the front handling guy patch to break loose from the bag, causing it to deflate. Another wind gust carried the airship into the hangar door frame, causing it to envelop and burst into flames. The C-2's destruction prompted the Army to move airship operations from Brooks to Scott Field, Illinois. The disaster and similar accidents led the U.S. military to replace highly explosive hydrogen gas with safer helium as the lifting medium in American military dirigibles. Commercial use of helium field airships eventually became the industry standard. Months prior to the end of airship operations, Brooks Field had become the center for primary flying. The War Department had decided to consolidate all primary flying instruction at one centralized location. 
Brooks Field was selected based on its reputation for top-notch flying instruction, characterized as the best in the country. Among instructor pilots who contributed to the base's pioneering reputation was Captain John McCready, who in 1918 had modified the Gosport system that significantly improved aviator safety and proficiency. McCready was an aviation pioneer who earned the title Father of Flying Instruction. He also earned one of aviation's top awards three times, the McKay Trophy. He claimed the prize for a series of record-breaking endurance flights that advanced high-altitude physiology, for inaugurating the first air-to-air -air refueling in aviation history, and for making the first non-stop coast-to-coast -coast flight in American history that included the first aerial mapping of the United States. Other notable Brooksfield instructor pilots were Claire Chenault, who later commanded the Flying Tigers during World War II, and Lawrence Craigie, the first military jet pilot who also co-developed retractable landing gear. Adding to Brooks Field's reputation for graduating the best Army pilots were American sports stars and future aviation legends. They included Lieutenant Harry Babcock, the 1912 Olympic champion in the pole vault, who had defeated the legendary Jim Thorpe for the gold medal. Nathan Twining, the first Air Force officer to become chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And future Air Force Chiefs of Staff, Curtis LeMay and Hoyt Vandenberg. Between 1922 and 1931, all U.S. Army flyers completed primary training at Brooks Field. Flying cadet graduates included pilots for whom Air Force bases were later named. George Holloman, Robert Travis, Ezekiel McClellan, Townsend Griffiths, Oscar Westover, and George Moody. Of the 5,573 flying cadets who participated in primary flight training at Brooks Field, less than half graduated. Training there was tough and dangerous. Jennies were often damaged by pilots because the planes had no brakes. The planes didn't have a tailwheel. When they landed, the planes would bounce. Sometimes they would flip over. John W. Stutz. The challenging course of flying instruction at Brooks Field even attracted barnstormers who wanted to improve their pilot skills.
Lindbergh wasted no time in studying to become an army pilot. He was diligent in his studies, spending his off-duty time and weekends to learn enough to not only pass the rigorous exams, but to excel in them. Flying cadets washed out if they failed just two tests. Lindbergh was at the top of his class. Writing to his parents, Lindbergh admitted that the Army had smoothed over the rough edges of a young pilot, eager to prove himself. The Army schools taught me what I had never learned before, how to study, even subjects in which I had no interest. For the first time in my experience, school and life became both rationally and emotionally connected. Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh earned a commission as a second lieutenant in the Air Service Reserve Corps after completing advanced training at Kelly Field in San Antonio in March 1925. He was one of only 18 from his original Brooksfield Flying Cadet class of 104 to earn pilot wings. Lindbergh subsequently pursued a civilian flying career with flying circuses at Lambert Field in St. Louis, then flew domestic airmail routes. Lured by the challenge of becoming the first pilot to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean, Lindbergh secured financial backing from St. Louis businessmen for his epic transatlantic voyage. He took off from New York's Roosevelt Field on Long Island in the spirit of St. Louis on Friday, May 20, 1927. 33 and a half hours and 3,614 miles later, he reached Paris, France. His Brooksfield training and navigation had served him well as he became the most celebrated living person in history. That flight just revolutionized and popularized aviation like nothing else before or since. Once people saw that, you know, one man could fly the ocean safely in a little airplane, you know, then there might, might just be something to this aviation. It might just be getting safe and maybe we should try it. And really, if you look at commercial air travel before Lindbergh and after Lindbergh, it just boomed tremendously because that's when people thought flying might just be safe and uh, reasonable and popular enough. And it was Lindbergh's flight that uh, really transformed the whole world of uh, civil and commercial aviation in the late 1920s. Less than a year before Charles Lindbergh made aviation history, Brooksfield was center stage in helping make Hollywood history with the filming of the silent movie classic, Wings. San Antonio was selected for on-location filming in the summer and fall of 1926. The primary reason for this was that most of the Army's aviation assets were at Brooks and Kelly Fields. The movie starred Richard Arlen, Clara Bow, and Charles Buddy Rogers. Directed by William Wellman, who had served as an American volunteer pilot in World War I, with the famed Lafayette Escadrille, the Paramount Pictures movie broke new ground in filmmaking. Wellman wanted to realistically depict wartime pilot training, as well as showcase their skills in World War I reenacted aerial combat. Never before in Hollywood history had such a large-scale military aviation project taken place. Unlike previous Hollywood aviation movies of the era that faked aerial scenes, Wellman used real pilots filmed while actually flying. Wellman trained Brooksfield pilots to operate special aerial cameras to capture in-flight aerial sequences. This technique, which recorded realistic aerial dogfights, led to Wings winning the Best Picture Oscar in 1927 during the inaugural year for the Academy Awards. State-of-the-art film engineering, using remote-controlled cameras, earned Wings a second Oscar for Best Special Effects. The movie premiered in 1927 timing that could not have been better in the wake of Lindbergh's historic transatlantic flight. Wings helped feed a growing widespread hunger in America for flying. This was an age when the public and U.S. military leaders increasingly gazed skyward for the latest aviation innovation or spectacular record-breaking airborne feat. Flying under the radar of aviation notoriety was an unobtrusive combat veteran who quietly but expeditiously went about his work as a pioneer parachutist at Brooks Field. Possessing a brilliant scientific mind oriented toward tactically enhancing warfighter performance, 
Sergeant Irwin Nichols did not fit the stereotype of a gruff, inarticulate World War I infantryman. Yet the Ohio native's restless imagination helped him envision Parachute's enormous potential as an effective offensive tactical asset, rather than their defensive use by aviators to survive aircraft emergencies. Nichols had been influenced in France during World War I by Colonel Billy Mitchell, who originated the idea of using airborne infantry. Nichols, however, took Mitchell's idea a step further. He believed that weapons, equipment, and supplies could effectively and safely be parachuted during combat operations. After the war, Nichols began parachute experiments at Brooks Field, where he was in charge of parachute training. Nichols had a staunch advocate for his ideas in Claire Chenault, who was director of primary training at Brooks Field. Together they hatched a bold plan to convince skeptical senior army leaders of the usefulness of airborne operations in supporting combat missions, a then new, untested, and controversial concept. They had to overcome a negative bias about parachutes that was prevalent then within the aviation community. Before the advent of parachutes as standardized equipment in 1920, most pilots didn't trust parachutes. This attitude prevailed until Nichols emerged as the leading authority on parachute development and employment. Nichols' ideas, such as form-fitting backpack parachutes he invented, forever changed how parachutes were viewed by pilots and tacticians. In 1928, Nichols and Chenault developed a workable solution to parachute jumps through a series of experiments that tested the sergeant's ideas, such as the use of static lines and air-dropping padded containers for arms and ammunition. The first public mass parachute demonstration, held at Brooks Field on Saturday, April 28, 1928, failed to impress Army Chief of Staff General Charles Somerville. The demonstration, limited in scope and execution, however, was the beginning of the world's first series of paratrooper experiments. the tenacious Nichols was emboldened by the Army Chief of Staff's rejection of his ideas. Like a chess master, Nichols plotted several moves ahead in his quest to transform parachute employment at the operational level of war. Nichols recruited volunteers who trusted his ability to teach them the techniques they needed for a successful demonstration of a mass parachute jump. Meanwhile, Nichols also wanted to know about the physiological effects on parachutists a scientific inquiry that would be repeated countless times at Brooks Field as the flying base morphed into the Air Force's Center for Aviation Science and Aerospace Medicine Research. Nichols believed a parachutist might become unconscious during a high-altitude freefall. He persuaded Dr. Harry Armstrong, an aviation pioneer and future Air Force Surgeon General, to make an experimental parachute jump to gauge the physiological aspects of a high-altitude freefall. Dr. Armstrong's observations led to the Army adopting freefalls as a way of reducing high altitudes effects of cold and oxygen deprivation called hypoxia. None of this groundbreaking research would have come to fruition had the milestone aviation event at Brooks Field that Nichols conceived, planned, and implemented not succeeded. At 11.45 a.m. Saturday, September 28, 1929, 18 men lashed to the wings of nine DH-4 de Havilland's, parachuted from 2,000 feet and into aviation history. Three padded containers housing Lewis machine guns were simultaneously dropped by parachute from three Douglas transports at 3,000 feet. Four minutes after the men, weapons, and ammo landed on the field, paratroopers were firing machine guns from positions on the ground. The first successful mass parachute jump in the history of the world had validated Nichols as both the inventor of the modern parachute and father of paratroopers. His proven ideas confirmed the practicality of tactical paratrooper warfare on which modern airborne operations are based. Nichols' revolutionary ideas also had an unintended benefit to humanity. Decades after he had successfully demonstrated the speed and accuracy of airdropping military personnel and material, parachuted food and supplies during humanitarian relief operations have helped millions of people worldwide. A 
few months before the 1929 mass parachute jump confirmed Brooksfield as an emerging center for military aviation innovation, a bespeckled, bow-legged, diminutive army officer with a giant imagination reported for duty at San Antonio's southernmost flying field. William Charles Ocker, like Nichols, was a visionary on a grand scale. His poor eyesight belied the fact that he clearly saw solutions to the dangers flying in clouds and bad weather posed to military and commercial aviation. Ocker was the first aviator to recognize the relationship between lack of visual cues in flight and pilot disorientation. During this era, pilots primarily relied on their senses to fly. However, Ocker knew the human vestibular system, which regulates balance, was simply unreliable, especially when flying in fog, clouds, or rain. The Philadelphia native's ultimate goal was to solve the persistent and often deadly danger all pilots faced, the loss of flight control in weather. The removal of the limitation imposed by weather is dependent upon two principal factors, the development of suitable instruments for flying during conditions of low or obscure visibility when the pilot cannot refer to terrestrial objects to keep his ship level, and the education of the pilot in the proper use of instruments. Colonel William Ocker. Several years before he arrived at Brooksfield, Ocker had flight tested in fog a bank and turn indicator that Elmer Sperry had invented that was based on an earlier design for a maritime gyroscope. In the early 1920s, only a few airplanes were equipped with needle and ball and airspeed meter. This crutch for the compass was an enigma in flight. Actually, the pilot was an enigma to himself. Our orders were to keep out of weather and land rather than penetrate obscure weather. Colonel Carl Crane. Instrument flight, what Ocker called blind flying, was considered by aviators as unnecessary. Some planes had fuel and